Thank you for the shushing. I like it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second keynote. I'm actually delighted to get to just chair today because uh, Dr. Moira Braniff is really my academic role model. She is an inspiration to other scholars like me. I am incredibly honored to be able to do this today. And let me tell you a little bit more about her. She joined the University of Ulster 2013 as a lecturer in sociology. In 2016, she became the director of INCOR, so it's the International Conflict Research Institute. How amazing is that? She is the director of an institute. I am the director of my life, I guess. <laughs> she has published a number of books on politics, social renewal, and societal change. Her monograph was published by I.B. Torres in 2011, Integrating the Balkans from Conflict to EU Expansion. Moira's co-authored books include Inside the Democratic Unionist Party from Protest to Power, OUP, some of, another co-editor is in the back there, co-author in the back there, at, which was uh, awarded the Brian Farrell Political Book of the Year Prize in 2015, and Conflict as Commemoration with, McDowell in, uh, with Palgrave Macmillan. Moira has held several research grants and is involved in international research partnerships. She is a British Academy Rising Star Award holder for engagement uh, in 2016-2017. She's also involved with the Horizon 2020 Award for exploring soft skills and peace building and an Erasmus project, wow, uh, developing peace studies curriculum in Georgia. She's been involved in the peer review process for the European Commission Research Executive Agency and the AHRC Peer Review College. She's also an academic friend of the European Peace Building and Liaison Office. So <laughs> please join me in welcoming Dr. Moira Braniff. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, I gotta say, yes, I do all of those things, and Maggie, in her accent and in her effervescent style, makes them sound so exciting and interesting. <laughs> but genuinely, my life's really boring and busy, so <laughs> I'm not gonna say they all, yeah, it sounds better whenever Maggie says it, but yeah, thank you, Maggie. A huge thank you to Maggie, Caroline, and George for this event. I think all of us who are fortunate enough to be here for this past couple of days have really enjoyed the, the interdisciplinary, the intersectoral. So we're all coming from different disciplines, different sectors, and we're all learning so much about each other's work. And we're also learning a lot about the challenges that we live and breathe in how we actually initiate and engage in peace processes. Um, part of my my bread and butter is is working in peace building, is working with groups and yes I have a co-author from the DUP book but I also have a comrade in arms and Claire Pearson at the back um, who frequently joins me on I should say misadventures um, in transforming um, communities in transition in Northern Ireland. So you know we are living and breathing these issues that you're all here researching or practicing or engaging in. And I feel very fortunate that Maggie, George and Caroline came up with this amazing idea to come to Manchester, um, a city that has its fair share of experiences of conflict, its fair share of um, Irish diaspora living here. Um, but also its experiences of dealing with um, issues of around social inclusion and exclusion, of um, socioeconomic barriers in society, but also in terms of how we think about um, different communities living in the same space. And for you three to bring us here, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you. A huge thank you. But I will crack on because um, there is coffee again at 3.30. I don't think Caroline has any more sandwiches for us, but we, have. <laughs> we do have coffee at 3.30. So um, I guess whenever I first agreed to come along and participate in this conference, I was feeling much more upbeat and optimistic about the peace process. Yes, it was a year ago, but... A, Politics is a, a fast-changing environment, and a lot happens within within one year. Um, often unpredictable, 
and certainly the election of Donald Trump and the Brexit vote left me reeling from the, the shocks and yes I will admit to wrapping myself in the European Union flag and drinking well one or two bottles of red wine you know to absorb the 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 problems that we will now face um, challenged by the Brexit vote and challenged by the challenge or by the the issues that very much have been raised by the English question, not the Irish question. Um, today what I do want to talk about is how the past 20 years, um, and it's everyone that I've listened to so far has been talking about where they were in 1998, but I kind of wanted to reflect about how the past 20 years have had their fair share of political surprises. Um, we have had our political parties, in my view, being fairly ineffective um, in advancing reconciliation. We've had civil society almost impotent and neutered in their attempts to advance any form of reconciliation at a political elite level. And we've had a grassroots experience of reconciliation that's not mirrored anywhere else across the political spectrum. At this point in the discussion, um, my view is that we're fixed. We're very familiar with this fixed set of diagnosis of what this impasse in Northern Ireland is. So we've had my undergraduate students are three years into their degree and they've spent two thirds of that degree without a functioning government. Um, so we have an elite level impasse. I ask them, what do you want to be after you graduate? So they're going to graduate in July. And the first thing they say to me is a politician. And I'm like, why? Well, you can, don't have to turn up. <laughs> you don't have to work. And, you know, you still get paid for it. So that's the culture of um, understanding around what politics is 20 years after agreement. And for me, as someone who lives in Northern Ireland and someone who raises her children in Northern Ireland, is, is really depressing, quite frankly, and also alarming. Brexit, its reasons and its rationale are well covered elsewhere. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. The ramifications, I view, are much well less um, contemplate it, so I will spend some time thinking about the ramifications of 20 years of, of agreement or negotiated agreement and 20 years of peace building. And I should say, unlike other peace processes, significant financial investment. Whenever you compare the Northern Ireland peace process to other peace processes, we are significantly better invested we have significant international donors in a way that other peace processes at the same time did not enjoy. So we have to, we do see ourselves as a case apart very much. We hold ourselves up as, a, as a, an example for other peace processes to follow. We commodify our peace process. But we had six billion invested in Northern Ireland from 1994 onwards. Um, and I beg the question, what has that transpired? I'm also going to argue that peace building, um, and these are all photos that I've taken in the first slide in 2017. Um, one of a peace wall that has grown, the middle one, has grown from 1970. It's changed, it's, it's grown from concrete base through to metal, through to fencing through to wire, through to barbed wire. Um, that's happened within 20 years of peace. Um, we have um, hollowed out communities in the first picture. And we also have an increase in memorials, an increase in memorials that um, extends beyond the urban of Belfast, Newry, Derry City. Um, but we see it in our rural communities as well. And we tend to memorialize for us, not for the other. My point 
today is that the 20 years of agreement has had its benefits, which I will list on maybe one slide, <laughs> but it has also had its significant challenges. Um, and due to the political leadership and due to, um, well, I promise not to be too controversial, but due to political leadership, and I'm including that in its most widest term, um, the spirit and the promise of the 1998 agreement, I'm going to argue, has been firmly cast aside and disrupted by the processes of peace building. Um, my colleague and friend, Robin Wilson, in 2016, reported in the Peace Monitoring Report that there is a social glue bonding Northern Ireland together, this concept of Northern Ireland identity. Um, I would argue that in two quick years from that statement of social glue by Robin Wilson, that the Northern Irish identity is completely um, been hoovered up by the Brexit um, discussion. So while in March 2017, whenever Caroline and Maggie and George first approached me to talk about this issue, and I was relatively upbeat about peace building and the peace agreement and um, where we are 20 years later, um, in that short year, I've become rather um, sad about the whole prospect. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, today I wanted to talk about this exhibit and this is one of the most exciting and original exhibitions that we've had commemorating um, the dead and the living in Northern Ireland. Um, this is Silent Testimony by Colin Davidson and it featured in the Ulster Museum and it's since been showcased in Paris, Dublin and New York and maybe some others. Um, but Colin Davidson's exhibition worked with the Wave Trauma Centre to work with those who have been bereaved or injured during the Troubles. And this exhibit is not of those who are dead, but those who are living. And those who are living with the testimony and the experience of um, the violence and murder that we had throughout the 30 plus years of the Troubles, the so-called Troubles. Um, the reason why I'm starting with this is that this is one of the very unique examples where we have um, a lack of identification of blame, a lack of identification of accountability or culpability in the exhibit. Um, quite often, and I was at, at presentations earlier, which, um, which were very the exhibits that they were talking about are very overtly um, about blame or about responsibility or about culpability. Colin in this exhibit, um, and I'm sure lots of you have um, gone in to visit this, he's not, this is not an exhibit about blame. It's about living with trauma, bereavement and violence. What struck me whenever I visited this in both Belfast and Dublin was that Whenever we leave um, the wounds of the past untreated, whenever we don't have justice, accountability, culpability, whenever we don't have prosecution, whenever we don't have um, reconciliation, whenever we don't have any truth or um, acknowledgement, and acknowledgement's a very important word whenever we talk about Northern Ireland, Whenever we don't have these things, the wounds that have been inflicted on people, like in Colin's exhibition, on these individuals and in these communities, they have not been healed. We have had 20 years of agreement and we don't talk about healing. Um, those who have been killed, I would argue they've been left behind. Um, their memory has been publicly exposed for political gain. They have been strict stripped of their emotional and empathetic dimension. They're no longer the sons, the brothers, the daughters, the wives, the husbands. They're no longer them, those people. Instead, 20 years of agreement means that they are 
relegated to a hierarchy of pain, a hierarchy of blame. Politicised victims have only become victims again. Part of my argument and part of my um, concern about the peace agreement is that history, rather than becoming an educational tool, rather than becoming something that equips us to better deal with the future, for me, history has become a repository of very useful pasts. We now pick up the lens of history through different caricatures and different distortions. Our memorials don't honour the dead. They just serve to placate the living. I think that in the past 15 years of, and more, as Stephen Hopkins reminded me, I'm an ageing academic. Um, the past 15 years of me studying and working and researching in communities in Northern Ireland has shown me that memorialisation, yes, it is a bone of contention, yes, it is a place of conflict and commemoration, but it's continually reappraised, it's continually um, transmitted to different generations. And as papers have shown earlier today and yesterday, that periodically the past, despite us having agreement, um, has descended into violence. There have been those tipping points where commemoration, typically not as Colin Davidson's inspires, but parading, does tend to um, descend into um, violence, rioting, and other behaviour. And a lot of my work has been trying to understand, well, actually, why does the past um, continue to emit um, violence? And, and this is a question I'm posing to a lot of you. I'm taking on board the, the privilege that I've been granted today and speaking to you directly in, in terms of what you're researching and, and writing about. But why has history not reclaimed the place of actually tackling and tackling some of those caricatures, tackling some of those distortions. The other point that I'm going to make is that time matters. This became a very famous uh, portrait of the 1998 agreement. And again, it's men in suits by and large, with the exception of some of my dear colleagues, notably Monica McWilliams from Ulster University. Um, but yeah, this shows us that time matters, but also time doesn't matter an inch. I can blink, and that's still the same photo that I would have, the still the same <coughs> portrait that I would have from 1998 to 2018. Politics in Northern Ireland is patriarchy. It's dominated by men, um, and it's dominated by men, largely white, middle-class men, um, that are, um, which it challenges us in terms of reconciliation and what we're thinking about in terms of reconciliation. Because the portrait here, as you can see, it doesn't include class, it doesn't include gender. It doesn't include ethnic diversity. It doesn't speak to the diversity of Northern Ireland in which I live and breathe on a daily basis. But as I say, time matters. And in another way, it matters. Not an inch, not a blink. Um, the title of my presentation, which is Political Paralysis, got me thinking about time and got me thinking about this concept of paralysis. So even though um, medically paralysis um, involves um, the lack of movement, there's other functioning happening. And even though for over 19 months now, I think, we haven't had any functioning government, 
not that we had much before, but there is none now. You know, I think the startling fact that Northern Ireland remains very bottom of the um, list of policy for all of the devolved institutions across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, we can see very clearly that Northern Ireland is not a terribly effective devolved institution. Um, this picture just reminds me that whenever we talk about paralysis, we, we are talking about it in every single regard. To move on very quickly, because I'm talking too much about the early stuff and I want to get into the meat of the presentation, but peace does fall apart. And I was really, um, I was introduced to um, this wonderful book recently. I don't know if anyone else has picked up on it, but it's something to, if you haven't, I put it on there so mm -hmm. you can um, go away with something else to read. Not Tom and I's book. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> thanks Maggie for the... But yeah, peace does and can fall apart. Um, the spirit of compromise in 1998, in my view, quickly was replaced by the spirit of um, ethnicization, by the spirit of power, by the spirit of, of disenfranchising um, the citizen. The years of agreement have provided many lessons and so many of you sitting here have written about them so much more eloquently than me, so I'm not going to rehash them. But they have been franchised and they have been commodified and sold all over the world. I was tempted to put up a picture of our politicians that we export on an annual basis to Washington or Bogota or Kosovo or wherever we export them to, but I thought I'll really rein myself in. And I will think much more about what does this tell us about the politicians that we are electing? Um, because we, things do fall apart. So when everything's fall apart, my question is, who pulls them back together? Um, is it the community? Is it the political elites? Is it the academics? Is it the practitioners? Is it the families? I'm not sure of the answer of that. But what I can see after 20 years of agreement in Northern Ireland is that the predacious and predatory politicians that we continue to elect very clearly know that they can win votes by saying vote for us to keep them out. So our politics is based on the idea that whatever you do, whatever you can get away with, whatever you can squander, that wins you votes. That's the peace process, as I see it, and I'm quite happy to be um, critiqued. Let's keep going. <laughs> I am happy to be critiqued, Caroline. <laughs> um, Eric Gordy, who, is, um, who writes quite a lot about the Balkans, um, reminds us that Northern Ireland and Serbia aren't that different. In Serbia, for example, likewise, they've had 22 years now since the Dayton Accords. We've had 20 years since the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Again, we can't even decide what to call it. Um, Caroline and team bicep, bicep step that by calling it agreement. Um, <laughs> but yes, we've had 20 years of agreement. But in Serbia, likewise, we have the same predicament. Um, if you vote and you campaign on this idea of vote us in to keep them out, your electorate continue to believe you and your electorate continue to demand or ask little <coughs> from you. So whenever your income or your circumstance doesn't improve during the peace process, it means that the political elites that you elect, they're not answerable. They're not accountable for delivering on societal needs. And whenever Eric analysed this about Serbia, I kind of started to think, this feels very like home. Um, which then led me to back to WB Yeats, which is where I was in 1998. 
Stephen Hopkins, <laughs> I'm eyeing him now, at the break said, oh, in 1998 you must have been doing this, and I reminded him no. I was just turned 18, and I voted for the first time, but I was studying for my A-levels, and one of my A-levels was English Literature with W.B. Yeats. And W.B. Yeats was very much to the forefront of my mind whenever I was voting in 1998. Not only for the second coming, where things do fall apart, but also for the many, the many poems that continue to haunt us from 1916, 1918 and onwards. Because we do know this is not new to Irish history, this is not new to Irish politics. The dead inform the living. So what we've had in 20 years is, and I'm standing here as, you know, someone who's very much in favour of peace building, don't get me wrong, but what we have is this period of 20 years of where we should be using the spirit of the 1998 agreement, where we should be um, catalyzing on the ethos that drove that agreement over the line. And I will come back to the role that women played in that a little bit later in the presentation. But as some of you saw yesterday, I had my, my little children in tow, one's nine and one's eight, so you know this is kind of new to them. And, and I was talking about this last night with them, and I was chatting with my students before I came here. And I was thinking, well, what does 20 years mean to that generation, to the new generation? Because, you know, Thanks, Stephen. Yes, I am the next generation. Um, but whenever time is a funny thing. So I started thinking 20 years down the line, what am I going to be thinking about the 1998 agreement? Is it even going to, you know, George, Maggie, Caroline, are we going to do this all again in 20 years? I don't know. But I started to think, well, in 20 years' time, my daughter or son might be standing here saying, do you know what? In 2018, it was a pretty awesome time for those essentialists, for those chauvinists, for those misogynists, for those who um, briefly and once again got the upper hand in politics in Northern Ireland. They keep convincing those glossy-eyed Americans that, to invest in our region, or those Europeans, we've got a crisis. We might need some extra investment. Um, or the internationals who might listen to us that the war was justified, the war. They might also find that this, um, and I'm going to use a Northern Ireland word here, but they also might find that that extremist politics of curmudgeon was very much just a product of the conflict. So we behave this way because that's how we always behaved. But 20 years is a lifetime. And in 20 years, in 2038, dare I, we might say, and again, we have Professor Hennessy, Commissioner, in the room. We might say we've spent lots of time in rooms talking about the past. We've spent lots of times in rooms talking about history and how we deal with identity and how we deal with all of these issues. But, and we've had all these serious discussions about A, B, and C. And actually, there's a lot of people in this room have had bestsellers because of the agreement. But actually, what are we doing to realize and bring about peace in Northern Ireland? Because I'm working, and my colleagues are working, and we're trying to recruit participants, and they're saying peace has meant nothing to me. Peace has not had one impact on my life. Peace? What's that? So I'm going to move on to just, and Sarah DeBrace McLeod reminded me that we all always have to have one slide about theory. So I'm going, to <laughs> I'm going to just bring this one. And I've kind of gone way back in history for this one. But um, from 1906, this concept of liminality. Um, so it's this case of betwixt and between. So are we at peace? Are we post-conflict? Are we post-war? Are we post-troubles? Are we post-agreement? Are we, are we a normal? 
normalize society? Um, and at what point do we start having that discussion? And at what point does Irish studies start to become much more about the issues that I've heard my <coughs> colleagues like Fiona Clare talk about earlier, um, about identity, politics, about um, human rights, about social rights, about social movements? At what point does Northern Ireland become about that, the everyday struggles, and stop becoming about people like me who keep talking about conflict? Um, but I wanted to introduce this concept of liminality because I'm kind of at the point where I don't know whether to, you know, crack my head off the wall with the frustration or to just, you know, run away. So it's either the two options. So I'm in a case of liminality at the moment as well. But way back in 1906, um, we were introduced to this concept of liminality. So it's this case of um, space and time where the situation can actually provide the conditions for personal and social transformation. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Belfast, will be able to recognize the wasteland that nothing has happened in for 20 years, um, which is caught up in the, the legislation around private ownership um, and shared space. It's a difficult quagmire to navigate. Um, but the case of liminality garnered um, a little bit more traction in the work of Sewell, who talks about it in the case of the French Revolution. So from the 12th of July, and I'm talking about the French, 12th of July, okay, in 1789, um, the taking of the Bastille, Sewell focuses on the 12 days of the generalised insecurity that followed that event. It's a stretch of time that we can think of as liminal and also highly emotional. Um, so from the 12th to the 24th of July in 1789, there was an extraordinary period of fear, rejoicing, violence and cultural creativity. And whenever I started to think about this conference, that quote came to mind. Not that I'm suggesting that we're thinking about fear, rejoicing, violence, but a lot of your work is thinking about the cultural creativity, thinking around violence, thinking about how we think of the joyful aspects of peace building, but also the fear that dominates. So for me, this concept of liminality um, does help us to understand about what the peace process could be but hasn't quite yet become. So liminal situations um, are the gaps, they are the ruptures, and they're the voids in this experience of peace building. They're the marginal places and times where new ideas and new concepts come forward. So you can see that yes, I am going to move forward into a little bit more positivity in this presentation, hopefully. So. Again, our lovely skyscraper. So I'll just get you to click on. Um, some of this you can see, some of it you can't, sorry. But um, we can, Northern Ireland, just some statistics that are relevant. So in 2017, 2018, this is 10 years after agreement and significant investment. 75% um, of the top 10% of deprived wards still remain so. So deprivation remains paramount in Northern Ireland. Um, we can also see that the suicide rate has doubled in Northern Ireland since the 1998 agreement. Um, from 2007 there were 379 rapes reported, 780 were reported in 2016. And again that's something we can perhaps discuss after. Um, paramilitarism remains a scourge in Northern Ireland. It remains an um, omnipresent problem. There are four, over 4,500 young people displaced and there have been 24 paramilitary murders in a 10-year period. Um, so just some stats. That makes me think, well, actually, what is peace? Um, there's four key points I'm going to race through, um, but if you want to... Um, 
yeah, I will talk about the agreement at 20, but I also want to talk about this idea that democracy has been dislocated throughout the 20 years of agreement, that the policy of the policies associated with peacemaking have actually had significant unintended consequences, and that the power, violence, and change conundrum remains very much a nexus where um, we, as practitioners and academics and um, people with vested interests in the Northern Irish peace process, have to be very much involved. Um, There's a lot of people here I work with, work with this idea that we're a society in transition. And I keep being the most you know, truculent child in the room and say, well, what are we transitioning to? I'm never quite sure, um, which makes me often think of this idea that we're actually chasing the dragon. We're chasing this elusive concept of peace that we don't fully comprehend or we don't fully know how to navigate. Um, the troubles are over. Um, but the paralysis created at both the political and the social level continues to linger. Um, we have this generation of politicians, as I mentioned, 20 years later, that believe that we, they can be voted in on this deep-seated fear around governance by them, not us. And for me and everyone else who lives in Northern Ireland, it rings hollow. You know, there's not anyone you speak to that knows that it's a hollow reason why they're voting for that party, but they still continue to vote for. Um, also, the 1998 agreement bequeathed us with this idea that we have to, rather than turn that generation of politicians or political elites into objects of ridicule, we idolise them. We turn out to vote for them, we mourn them, we memorialise them. Um, the 1998 agreement didn't end terrorism, it inscribed it. And that is not fading 20 years later. Memorialization continues to boom. There's names and walls that sisters or mothers have not said that name belongs in that wall. They're my son, they're my brother, ask me. First, for the two main parties, we do have polarised narratives. We do have this um, idea that it's a green and orange axis. I would argue that the green and orange axis um, continues to monopolise public sentiment, but fortunately, I think, as always, that has been the case. Um, and you know the statistics throughout the Troubles better than me, but that green and orange axis is a fairly phony axis, actually. Um, we've seen with recent protests around gender rights, around reproductive rights, around equal marriage, that actually the green and orange, yeah, I would argue, is fairly phony. But yet, we elect on those bases. Um, I would question whether or not this is a time where we start to um, ignore the green and orange axis, if we could. Um, could we have the discussion on a different level? Ultimately, I think my um, ambitions for that are probably a little bit early um, because there is an absence of any kind of public coherent discourse on justice, on rights in Northern Ireland. Um, Ultimately, what we have is individual stories about justice or about rights um, and about retribution. And someone, I think it was Fiona, talked earlier today about the Stephen Nolan show. This is the part you want to delete. Okay. Um, but it comes back to the individual. It comes back to the individual stories. How does this make you feel? We don't talk about societal norms. We don't talk about societal ambitions. We talk about how do you feel? which is important, but it's also, if we're thinking about a society transitioning, we need to be thinking about how can society view justice, how can society um, heal. In 20 years, I would argue that the H word and the R word, they're the bad words. 
They're the words we don't use. We don't use reconciliation anymore. I went through the program, and it's in a really extensive program, and I think it's fabulous and wonderful, but there's one paper talking about reconciliation overtly on your two pages. I've gone through IPS, very few papers in Irish political studies about reconciliation. Where has reconciliation gone? Why do we not talk about healing? I ran a panel last year at the West Belfast Festival on healing, and we had a huge audience, but no one talked about really the H word. Healing is a difficult concept to think about. Um, because, of course, Northern Ireland and the 1998 agreement was very ambiguous about a lot of these issues, and that's why we are now still struggling with them. We're still chasing the 1998 dragon as it were. I did want to put paralysis in context because um, we're talking about paralysis, well I'm talking about paralysis in 2018, bearing in mind those dead and bearing in mind um, the difficulties that were experienced throughout the troubles and I've left this quote for you to read. It's a, from a book edited by Julie Campbell, um, published by Guildhall Press in 2016. <coughs> so I'll just give you a moment to have a look at this. And the chapter's entitled, My Brother <coughs> Was a Pencil Sketch That Hung in Our Living Room. And of course, this is a very different kind of paralysis than what we're talking about. So 20 years later, I am mindful of that as well. Um, just to move on, I wanted to um, talk about the failure of the 1998 agreement to bring about physical and personal security um, and to bring about real and sustained change, not only on a political elite level but also on a grassroots level. The social relationships of power and dependency did transcend the 1998 agreement um, so what was happening throughout the, the 30 plus years of the Troubles continued. The structures remained in place. Some communities benefited from the peace dividend. Others saw very few economic dividends. Um, less than would be expected. And what we can see 20 years later is that the political and social marginalisation <coughs> of those communities remains high and has actually increased. So we can see that the high levels of insecurity um, and bringing to mind the work of Christina Steenkamp is this idea that yes, we have agreement, but that doesn't necessarily translate into something where people are living and breathing <coughs> in a fabric of very reconciled societies. So in order to think about whether peace and transition cooperate, whether they succeed or fail. Um, for me, it's important to think about how we can consider violence and peace at this moment in Northern Ireland. The other aspect that I wanted to highlight very briefly is one of the key um, findings that I think is starting to emerge from 20 years of agreement is that democracy has been firmly dislocated um, and you might say that's a given, but I think it's about time that we started to say it in a much more public way, that the functioning of the executive and the Northern Ireland Assembly, or the dysfunctionality of it rather, has demonstrated that um, power sharing and in its form that we have um, has been, well it was initially according to all the textbooks I read in 1998 to 2002 while I was doing my degree, it was a, meant to be a temporary fix, a band-aid, a, a way of building trust. And we know that it entrenched um, ethnicisation and division. But what we do have is that this dislocation of democracy has been created through the perceived illegitimacy of those institutions, very much self-interested political parties, <coughs> and policy that fails to serve the public interest, which unsurprisingly has bred significant political alienation, but it's political alienation 
with a caveat, because we still turn out in huge numbers to vote. And you might say, well, 60% is not huge numbers, but whenever there's only 19% of people in Moldova voting, over 60% of people in Northern Ireland voting is, is quite significant. The location of democracy in parliament buildings is not where democracy is actually happening in Northern Ireland. Um, I was at presentations earlier, and they were talking about the democracy within museums, the democracy on the streets. So the contradictions and the failures of democracy in parliament buildings um, are very much apparent. They're very readily <coughs> available. Um, and we can see that democracy has been dislocated from the political parties, from the DUP, from Sinn Féin. They're not what's governing how we work and live and breathe in Northern Ireland. The other aspect that I wanted to um, briefly talk about is this um, work by, that we carried out recently on the unintended consequences of peace building. In 1998, there was, there was this idea that we can have um, a future proofing and future forming um, legislation encompassed in the Section 75 um, North, of the Northern Ireland Act, the so-called Equality and Good Relations Act. Um, in our research, we can sh we've shown that actually in the 20 years period, this piece of legislation has been utilised. One example is from McCreesh Park, but it's been happening across public spaces um, to ensure that actually people remember that this is our space and not your space. This is what you did to us, and this is how we continue to suffer. Um, so what we can see is that despite initiatives such as equality and good relations um, legislation being fairly effective mechanisms, we can see very clearly that they have been um, weaponized to any kind of future proofing or any kind of future forming that would lead to reconciliation or better community relations. Two weeks ago I spoke at a, an event to talk about the Good Friday Agreement mm -hmm. and um, it was a very small and intimate event and there was no PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. be, why did you not go to that one? You'll be asking yourselves. Mm -hmm. But there was no PowerPoint, there was nothing. And, um, and the question I was asked, well, what are we celebrating? What are we celebrating whenever we talk about the 1998 agreement? And I kind of agreed with them because someone mentioned earlier that, yes, we are here to talk about 1998, but there's also a lot of people who um, don't want to talk about 1998. They don't want to be associated with it. They are running screaming from the conferences that are being organized left, right, and center at the moment. Um, because 1998 hasn't delivered. Um, it hasn't delivered on what we expected it to. And we can see this through the levels of economic and social deprivation as just one indicator. But also individual agency, social justice, um, community justice, individual justice, everyday life is not what I voted yes for in 1998. I'm going to briefly um, skip through because I just want to finish. I've over talked, but I want to talk about this. Maggie is awesome because she's keeping up with my, my, my random talking through these slides. But um, I wanted to finish just by imploring the people and the diverse group that we have in this room today to continue to view women as agents of change in peace processes. In 1918, yeah, I'm going back a little bit now, but in 1918, women voted for the first time. And I want to think about what 100 years in Ireland might have been like. It might have been even more contentious. It might have been even more difficult if women hadn't have been voting in 1918. Um, and in fact, in 1998, it was the women who got the agreement over the line. It was the women's coalition who ensured that the 1998 agreement um, lived and breathed. And for that, we can be thankful. Um, but I work with women 
and I work with women on a on a daily basis and they're in my classrooms, they're in my in my groups. And what we can see is that women continue to struggle against patriarchy in Northern Ireland. We had it in the panel earlier on reproductive rights and gender rights. Um, but what I can see, and I should say in 1998, whenever I started my degree in Queen's, I didn't start it in Irish politics. I was not a baby of the ceasefire. I was not a child of the agreement. I was escaping Northern Ireland. I studied Cyprus, I studied the Balkans. Anyone talked to me about Northern Ireland, I ran to the other side of the room. Um, but that international experience has shown me that, and I'm very fortunate to study in those places, but whether it's Colombia, whether it's Argentina, Siberia, or Serbia rather, it's the women in these places who change the conflict. They're the trans transformative agents. They're the people who create peace challenge that women are facing in Northern Ireland is patriarchy, but it's patriarchy in its worst form because it's patriarchy combined with paramilitarism. And women who are desperately seeking change within these communities in transition are deeply blighted by paramilitaries. That affects self-esteem, it affects confidence, it affects how they live on a daily basis, um, self-confidence, networking. We have women's groups who have to meet outside five miles outside of their own communities because they don't want their paramilitaries, their paramilitaries, to know that they're networking, to know that they're discussing, to know that they're sharing their stories. Um, so I'm going to finish today with thinking about, <coughs> well actually, a challenge for our politicians and a challenge for us here is to think about how do we, how do we progress through this paralysis and it's a bit of a curveball. So I'm just raising the question. So instead of thinking about what do we do now, what do we want in 20 years time? What do we want this peace agreement to mean? What do we want it to have, or how do we want it to have the impact on the lives in 20 years time? And if we start to think 20 years time, that'll change how we think about now. So I'm kind of coming full circle to thinking about time. And my last point is to go back to saying thanks. The very last one, Maggie. I'm moving on. But I wanted to thank again Caroline, Maggie and George and all of your amazing team, but also the variety of people who have made my research possible for the last um, number of years, but also my amazing female colleagues, Sarah Panache, Brianie Reid and me, who take the photos that I included today. So thank you.
uh, locus of this problem with participatory parliamentary democracy um, might be missing a larger problem that the entire UK is suffering from and is being and is manifesting in different ways in the collapse of the Assembly and Northern Ireland and sort of the changes we've seen within the Labour and the Conservatives over uh, recent elections. And I want to, but what I want to ask you is, would you agree with that? And if not, what makes Northern Ireland so different? Um, I like your thinking, but I'm going to say that I would continue to contend that the Northern Ireland experience is not, in my view, similar to why people vote Tory or vote Labour, because it's not about my life will be immeasurably different if I vote Sinn Féin or if I vote DUP, um, <coughs> in the way that people would say, if I vote Labour, I won't get this service, this service, or this service. It's a different kind of voting pattern, and it's not something that's based on necessary rational gain. It's something that's based upon the very basic concept that we we don't. Our life will be our life will be the same regardless of who we vote for, but we're going to vote along ethnic lines. The point that I didn't make was that, yes, 60 odd percent of people still vote in Northern Ireland, but that has declined significantly from 1998. And what we can also see is the trend in political <coughs> information has been particularly exacerbated um, within the Nationalist Republican Catholic voting pop population. So they're <coughs> less likely to vote. I do think there's a different dynamic at play, and I kind of wish I could say yes. It is. It's. It's like voting Labour Conservative, but there's such a zero sum ethnic division at play that it. it and in so many ways, it's so irrational. And there's voting experts here in the room who will argue this better than me, but. And I'm not a voting expert, but my view is that we can see that through the decline of the Catholic Nationalist Republican vote and through the consistent electoral gains of the extremist and essentialist and ineffective government of DUP Sinn Féin, that it's, you know, it, it, for me it doesn't quite translate. I think for me, Serbia or Bosnia this is a much more easy comparison than Westminster. Sorry, um, looking back, um, I really like that you pose the challenge to um, think more about reconciliation. Um, and I was just wondering if you, if anything came to mind that the political elite could learn from communities in regard to reconciliation and how that's. Um, I think there's a lot that can be learned um, from communities and Fiona talked earlier about how we based our agreement on contract theory and if we think back to the early 90s um, the kinds of and even the early late 80s the kinds of contacts were happening at a political elite level um, the kinds of negotiations that were being undertaken whether it was in a Quaker House, whether it was in Glen Cree, whether it was in Carmida, mm -hmm. but there were conversations happening between political elites and political parties. There was relationship building, there was um, confidence building. They continue to happen throughout the peace process on a community level, but we kind of didn't keep doing that at a an elite level, we kind of just put them up into parliament buildings or into Belfast City Council or Derry City Council and said, you know what, figure it out in the chamber. We <coughs> forgot to do the confidence and relationship building element with our political elites. And so much so that you still have political parties getting into a lift with one another and no one can hit the button because they don't know what floor 
they're all going to, they won't ask each other. So we still have the challenge around the very basic kind of relationships at an elite level. So if there is one lesson to be taken from community level, um, and then a lot of cross-community work was undertaken, um, which has revealed its own lessons, because cross-community work was undertaken at a time whenever communities weren't even fully aware of their own identities or fully aware of their complexities within themselves to be starting that outreach. And that's where you see a lot of community work now taking place on a very much a single identity basis. But that's one lesson that maybe could be taken forward or, or taken up. Um, and after 20 years of watching this process unfurl, I'm very much hesitant to kind of go, the locals where it's at and the liberal peace building model is, is you know, completely dead in the water. I'm kind of still torn between both of those because I do think there's a role for individual agency within all of this. The other aspect that my research has shown over the past number of years is that whenever you do have those um, almost constellations of individuals acting within any organisation or within any political party, at, at inventing opportunities for peace building or inventing opportunities for reconciliation, it does tend to drive processes forward. So I think we can't miss out <coughs> those individuals who have driven the process forward in very unanticipated ways. One final question. Colonel John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tommy? I really, really enjoyed that. And this is what we're thinking. Obviously, because of the history of Northern Ireland, like Utopia and Impulse has been very, very strong in Northern Ireland. And basically, I think maybe that came across in paper, one of the problems with the agreement and the whole spur of 1998 was that it was very Utopia. There was this idea that like, you could raise up a new Northern Ireland. And from your paper, Ken, was, you were sort of almost tracking the set of the dystopia. And it, you know what I mean? Like it, it said, you know, you're just kind of like, it almost yeah, kind of like, I was like, so this is the dystopia now. It's like a, a, a dystopia is a, a, a utopia that half descended. And part of me sort of thinks is the problem with 1998, do you think that maybe it was too utopian? And are we also quite utopian in the sense that no matter what Northern Ireland comes into existence now, it probably won't be that utopia. There's always going to be something wrong with the Northern Ireland that no matter what, even if, even if the shivers in the BUP somehow evaporate, in ten years' time, will still not be. It'll, it'll still not be the Northern Ireland that was promised in 1998. If you know what I mean, that the utopian impulse is kind of good and bad. And as, as someone who, in 1998, was very eager to go and vote yes, and was very eager that, in spite of everything that happened in the short months after it, was very eager to support. Um, the terms of the agreement, um, and just to stop the mayhem. I would never say it was too utopian. I say it was the best deal that they could get, and I think Tom talked about this in depth yesterday, but my view was that 1998 was a stepping stone. It certainly wasn't the utopia, and the language of the agreement is cautious, it's ambiguous, it's, it's I, I wouldn't necessarily agree it's utopian, it's, it's it's brave, it's courageous, and 1998 was only driven forward by very brave individuals who helped to support that process. Um, what we have 20 years later, sorry for describing it as a dystopia, <laughs> but in many ways it, it, it has become a, it has become less than what was um, desired in 1998 and I think that's what's the hardest thing to take is because life does disappoint and life it does and it and it's but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone sitting in this room gives up on the whole idea of reconciliation or peace building mm -hmm. or or researching into historical truths or researching into um, justice or um, or even, do you know what, advancing the discussion, because here I've heard, and in other rooms like this, I've heard so much amazing work that people are doing around literature, around culture, around reproductive rights, around gender rights, around all of these issues that actually advance the discussion in new and innovative ways. So whenever I start to think about, well actually, yes, we're 20 years into something, 
and personally I might think we still have a long way to go we're still we're still moving through that process on that note I think we should <laughs> <laughs> yay moving through the process I think we should have a coffee break